Hello, everyone, and welcome to another live edition here on my channel, Luis Borrero Visual Artist. Thank you for coming by. Today, I'm going to be uh, working on a Rembrandt uh, master copy. Uh, in the past few lives that we've had, we've been uh, working with materials. I've been detailing uh, early Rembrandt techniques. And later on, we uh, studied uh, the ground that is made up of sand. I demonstrated the whole process in one of the past videos. So if you're interested in checking that video out, that will give you some context of what we will be doing uh, today in this live presentation. So first of all, I want to thank everyone for coming by. And again, thank you for your wonderful support. We're uh, at 800 uh, viewers on the channel. That's really wonderful. I'm really thankful uh, and grateful for your support. So uh, let's just go ahead and get started today. Uh, so what I did in the past uh, live presentations is I've been focusing primarily on materials. The materials, uh, an exploration, in-depth exploration of the materials that Rembrandt would have used, uh, the preparation, and how they differ from the early period in his life and towards the late, late style and, uh, and the style in which he's using uh, heavy impasto and textures to describe form. So. What I did in this uh, present, what I'm going to be doing in this presentation is a full demonstration uh, that I pre recorded. It's a three day demonstration. Um, I used some technical analysis from the National Gallery Technical Bulletin and also from uh, the book uh, Art in the Making, which I've mentioned before. And if you're interested in any of these books, you could check out the description below. It has a link to uh, my kit which has a list of all the books that I usually use in the live presentation. So make sure to check that out. Uh, also, make sure to subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so and share the content with your friends. So um, this book uh, details uh, all the chemical analysis that the gallery, uh, the National Gallery in London has done in the past 20 years or even probably the last 30, 40 years. Uh, th there's a lot of uh, research that has been going on by the Rembrandt Project, and they have published a lot of these results in a comprehensive uh, PDF or book. Uh, I think one of our uh, viewers shared one of the links in the past video, so you can look through those links. There's just some amazing, uh, wonderful links in the, in the descriptions and in the comments, so make sure to check those out. So um, I took that information and I did a recreation of these techniques. What I did was I created the materials, uh, hand mold the paint, uh, prepared the oils, um, all that you know, preparation or pre-preparation prior to painting. Uh, the palette that I use was uh, the same, very same colors that they uh, found in the, uh, in the paint analysis. So, and in the ground that we made uh, two weeks ago, I let uh, I put a dryer. Uh, a lead dryer with the sand and the brown ochre, which are powerful. The brown ochre is a powerful dryer. And I, I let it cure for about two weeks. And, and after that, I executed the, the, um, the demonstration. And I pre-recorded everything. So before I share the demonstration, um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about the evolution. I've had uh, some of the uh, viewers ask, uh, whether Rembrandt used a guisai in his preparations. And I've seen other uh, YouTube videos where um, painters are using a guisai. And I do believe that Rembrandt did use a guisai in some of his underpaintings. Uh, it has been documented. Uh, I want to show, show you uh, the first image that I, uh, that I have here in, my, uh, in the image files. Uh, this, is, this painting from 1642 is the title, The Concord of the State. Um, and here you can see where Rembrandt is using, indeed, uh, sort of an underpainting guisai. He, he works on a reddish ground, um, and he is working in sort of a monochromatic uh, uh, with a very limited palette, just slinging in the forms. Even the sky is sort of done in this grayish color. Um, and this is typical. I mean, he would have been trained by uh, past masters that were accustomed to this style. Uh, I have mentioned in some of the live presentations here, the use of Grisai in Renaissance, early Renaissance painting, and the evolution of Grisai. So this is a standard technique that a lot of artists have been using. 
over a, a monochromatic sketch. Um, however, in his later period, I discovered that Rembrandt sort of abandons this technique and his process becomes a lot more direct. He's working with uh, a limited palette, um, but he's applying the color a lot more freely, uh, a lot more like an impressionist uh, artist would have done in the 19th century, where uh, it's just a quick sketch and then he's just applying the color directly on the canvas. And that's the approach that I uh, essentially took uh, when I set out to do this copy. I did my uh, well, my investigations to see if indeed I would have been, he would have been using um, a grisaille or if he was just working with direct color. So what I did is I replicated the palette. The palette is essentially lead white, yellow ochre, red ochre, steel de grain, which is a, a pigment that I mentioned, I think, in the last uh, presentation. I'm using Matter Lake, brown ochre, Italian romber, and black, bone black. Um, there's no vermilion or blues. Uh, that they don't find them in the chemical analysis, so that's exactly the same palette. Oh, and I did use orange ochre, which is a color that is unusual in my palette, uh, but it, it is found indeed uh, as an underpainting color uh, that it, he mixes with uh, the uh, Matter Lake and other colors to sort of you know, create this uh, orangey tones. So, and indeed you see in some of his paintings uh, that he's using this sort of orangey color. So perhaps it was an orange ochre and he was accustomed to using orange ochre as well. So um, this painting from 1642 is a painting that he's essentially using that very technique that he would have been using in his early paintings. We move on to a painting from, um, and I have my notes here from 1660. It's a self-portrait. And here he's, uh, he's using a bolder style. Um, and then yeah, there's another portrait there from 1661, uh, Rembrandt's self-portrait as an apostle. Uh, and these are paintings that are painted with a lot of impasto. They're very free. So um, and why do I believe that he didn't use a grisaille in these paintings? Well. They're very opaque. So the grisaille is essentially a painting technique where you would be using the under layer, the under gray tone to uh, uh, perhaps put a velatura, which is a semi-translucent color um, to, to create that optical color illusion, right? And in this case, his technique is just so straightforward. He's applying thick paint. He's using uh, you know very expressive brushwork. So uh, these are this is a case where perhaps uh, he was just experimenting, going back to that um, style of Titian, which is very direct. Um, the palette is limited. The palette is not a lot of, there's, there's not explosions of color, but um, he's very much interested in the, the expressiveness of the brushwork and also the texture, the textural quality, the tangible qualities of the work. So um, these are two uh, portraits that were done before uh, the uh, portrait that I copied, uh, and I used them as a sort of um, starting point to sort of analyze uh, what he would have been doing. Um, now, in the bottom portrait, the portrait of uh, Satan Apostle, um, this portrait right here, let's see, <laughs> this portrait right here. Okay, the bottom portrait. Uh, the camera's backwards, so. Um, so, uh, he, it looks like he used an, a monochromatic painting indeed, or perhaps a more limited painting than lay the, the, the full color on top of that. So perhaps he did he did a, an impasto um, monochromatic color uh, study with uh, perhaps uh, three colors. Um, uh, you could use the white, light white, the yellow ochre, and maybe black uh, and create this sort of greenish sort of grisaille, which I've talked about before. Caravaggio uh, seems to have used that technique, um, but it, you know, we'll never know. And the chemical analysis in this last portrait that I copied, they, they find uh, a brownish under sketch or under painting, but they don't find any white mixed with that. So it seems like he just laid in a sort of a sketchy sort of uh, under, uh, under sketch uh, very, very loosely. And then he moved on to the building up of the impasto layer. And that's essentially what I'm going to be focusing on. I do have one uh, last piece of evidence here, which is a portrait of an er elderly man, a 
from 1667. And there in this in these uh, images, you could see the ground indeed, this brownish ground. Uh, you see it around the eyes, around the nose, and around the mouth. Um, and you see how it's very free. He's almost picking up the light white with the red ochre and just putting it, uh, you know, around the eyes in a, in a, or around the, the lips in a very sort of schematic way, uh, which is very loose brushwork. Um, so that's where I've got the evidence from, and that's I uh, did my copy using this uh, model, which is essentially a brown ground. Um, and I don't know if this is a sand. I'm not sure if this is a, this ground that he did he used for this painting in particular as any sand, but uh, it is a brownish type of ground, darker ground. And uh, he's just painting very freely with a brush, just really describing the form with the impasto. So that's the approach that I um, that I took to do this copy. Now, one of the things that I want to talk before I show you the demonstration, I'm going to be narrating. This is a time lapse, so it's three days compressed into 12 minutes. I uh, I saw that in the chemical analysis, it's essentially three layers of paint, up to maybe four layers of paint. So I just sort of theorized that the painting took him three days or three sessions to do, or perhaps perhaps a little bit longer, but they don't find 12 layers like they do in Titian's paintings or even eight layers uh, in some of Titian's paintings. So, and what, is, what does that mean? As what, what type of evidence that gives me as an artist to sort of go uh, from and, and sort of build up a picture of how he would have been working? Well, uh, to build impasto, you need the, the layer the first layer to dry. So for example, in this demonstration, I did the under sketch and the first lay-in or the working up as has been described by uh, Van Wethersheim, which is, he's the art, uh, author of the uh, Rembrandt painter work. He describes the sequence, the under sketch or the under or monochromatic sketch, the working up, and the finishing and retouching or glazing and retouching. And that's just actually the sequence that you're going to see that I described in throughout the whole demonstration. Um, now, this is important because each layer really needs time to dry. You can, if you're building up impasto, that layer has to dry. The lead white will have to dry. If it's painted very thickly, you have to allow it to dry to in order to build more paint on top. So. That's essentially what you're going to see is three layers of paint. It, the whole demonstration took three days, although I waited you know, a couple days and, and I did use lead dryers, a little bit of uh, lead uh, oil, leaded oil uh, mixed with the paint just to, you know, uh, to uh, instigate that, that drying. So uh, that's essentially the whole process that I did, that I went through to, to do this demonstration. So I want to share this demonstration with you guys so you can see and perhaps uh, just imagine. Um, now there's one little detail that I want to mention. Um, the brushes that I used, uh, you'll see me mention the brushes. I tried to use just bristle brushes initially, um, but I was not getting the fluid brushwork uh, that Rembrandt uh, exhibits here. So then I had to switch to a softer brush, which is uh, the mongoose hair brush. And the mongoose hairbrush worked the best on this uh, very sort of, uh, the ground is rough because it has a little bit of sand, but I did pumice the ground uh, slightly uh, because it was just too rough. When I, once I applied it from the last uh, video that I did, I applied this ground with a palette knife and I let it dry. It dried wonderful, um, but uh, it was just a bit rough. So I had to take it back with a little bit of a pumice stone, not much. And then it was just perfect. So just want to give you that piece of information for those of you that are uh, trying this ground at home and want to experiment. So um, and the brushes that worked best with this ground were the mongoose hair. The mongoose hair and the polecat brush was just wonderful. The bristle brush just struggled to to you know it was just breaking up the paint was just not not moving as well. So um, and then. I finished the painting with a nice sable brush, and that worked beautiful. So, um, but not in the first layers because it's too rough for a sable brush. So, 
All right, so let's take a look at uh, a demonstration here. I have prepared this video, and I'm just going to narrate, as I usually do, um, and just describe the palette and the process. So let's just take a look at that video. So um, the monochromatic undersketch is essentially uh, a very quick schematic sketch with brown ochre. This is a standard. I've talked about this before. Uh, there's the original uh, right next to it, and I'm just using a very uh, I'm using calipers to figure out the proportions because this is this is a very loose type painting. Uh, so as I'm I'm just working very freely and correcting the drawing with the calipers, making sure that I don't stray too. But it's not meant to be a very tight underdrawing. Uh, I don't Rembrandt did not work with it under um, with, excuse me with the transfer drawing at all. It's just I am drawing with a bristle brush, thinned out paint with a slight uh, amount of uh, linseed oil, leaded linseed oil with dissolved with um, spike oil of lavender. I'm just fixing the proportions, uh, establishing in that brown underlayer that that sort of um, sketchy uh, thinned out paint quality uh, for the background will set you know it gave me an undertone that will really help me set the colors. On top. So, and now I move on in the same session to the working up stage. And what is this? Was well, essentially mixing up the actual opaque paint. I'm using lead white, uh, red ochre, and uh, excuse me, lead white, yellow ochre, black, and a little bit of red ochre. Uh, and there's no, I'm, I'm not limiting the color, although the color is limited because the palette is limited. And I'm just looking for the light masses, establishing in blocks. And I'm using a mongoose hair brush in this in this case, just looking for those, uh, you know, that initial modeling, establishing the the initial tone, the light, just bringing out the light. This is a very dark ground, so I had it's very important to work very uh, opaquely. It's difficult to work uh, semi-transparently. That's that was my initial reaction to the ground, so I had to, you know. Uh, work with impasto right away to establish a light mass. So um, that is, seems to be consistent with what Rembrandt was doing. Now you'll notice that in the hat, I'm I'm going to be painting the hat a lighter color. That's because I they found um, that Rembrandt corrected the hat in the in the X-ray, and, uh, and essentially I wanted to recreate that whole process. So I painted the hat in a white, uh, you know, sort of light color. And my plan is to glaze it later on, as he did in the final painting. So once I have established those basic tones, I just continue to put more and more paint to create the subtlety. Now, this is a process that takes a while. It takes many hours to build that impasto and those subtle colors. So I'm mixing. I am not blending any of the color. That was the key to this technique. Not blending the color. You just apply it in touches. And you just continue to draw almost with the white. It's like heightening with the white. Um, so uh, I found myself mixing a lot of grays with yellow ochre and black. Okay, and that, that served as a cool color, which gave me this very wonderful cools uh, in, on the flesh color. Um, and it's consistent with what they find. They find ochres. They find black. Um, now. They don't, they don't really find a grisaille layer, and at least it's in the documents that I saw, uh, there's no grisaille, so I skipped the grisaille. I just went straight for the color. There I'm applying some initial background color that matches just slightly warmer than the uh, brown ochre of the ground. And I switched to a small sable brush, and now I'm refining the drawing somewhat. Uh, and, you know, this, uh, throughout this whole the uh, process I'm drawing constantly with the brush and with paint. I found myself uh, working in a very loose style and then having to correct the drawing later on or even throughout the whole painting using the calibers. So because if you get too tight with the drawing, then you lose. There you see where I'm, I'm applying the hat. Uh, he seems to have corrected the hat. He had a, a bigger hat at one point. And it seems like he just changed it. So I wanted to replicate that effect, and uh, that's exactly what I did. So with the uh, small brush, the sable brush, I'm just picking out the touches. And again, this is the very first session. Um, and 
this whole session is just about building up the paint, getting, trying to get an approximate tone of uh, what, you know, what the final uh, image would be. Now, it's important there, I'm going for the straight uh, orange ochre, um, and I'm just applying the straight color. That's exactly what they find right over the ground, an orange ochre uh, and a little bit of black and lake color. The background's essentially just a veil of um, semi-transparent pigments right on top of the brown ground. So, and throughout this whole process, I found myself just uh, just putting pieces of paint, uh, touches of paint, um, thousands of touches of paints to create a collective uh, effect. Uh, no blending at all. Uh, you just blend by putting more color. The second day, this is the second day, uh, I let the paint dry. You see there that the color died, and that's why the painting looks lighter. This is normal. And what I do is in the second session is I'm applying a glaze there, uh, still the grain, matter lake, and a little bit of black, just to sort of push those tones. This glaze is very transparent, and I glaze over the orange ochre of the neck, okay, of the collar. And I'll bring that glaze through the, all around the, the painting just to push those darks. And this saturates the darks and it, it sort of pushes, you know, it sort of um, gives me a, a, a tonal uh, saturation so I can see where I'm going with the light and the darks. I'll, I'll spread that color uh, around the shadow areas. And in the background, I'm working right into that white glaze with semi transparent colors such as. Uh, Ochres and siennas. Okay, so um, this is now. I, I didn't want to paint the, the background completely opaque. It doesn't seem like Rembrandt paints the background completely opaque. He's using semi transparent colors, and this gives a nice sense of space. Uh, there, I'm beginning to correct, make that correction on the hat just to sort of replicate what he would have done. I just brought the background color right over it. Okay, and I'm just interested in saturating um, the colors and just making sure that there I, I'm using a glaze over the hat with that initial uh, of a, uh, lay in. And you see how that just gives you a nice color. Uh, it's red lake, a little bit of orange ochre, and black over the hat. Um, now I'm using that glaze in the flesh color. And this is just almost like staining staining quality uh, of the impasto. Uh, it's not going to stay like that because I'm going to work back into it. Uh, but that just gives me that sort of a, uh, I've demonstrated this in the last a live presentation where you take an impasto and you could just rub uh, a nice glaze over it and to bring out the textures and to almost, uh, you know, adjust the tones. So, um, and I'll just continue to really just saturate uh, the colors. And you saw that I'm using the calipers. I'm still measuring and making sure that I haven't strayed from the drawing because this is, you know, very loose painting. I'm not, you know, uh, modeling. Uh, I'm not coloring in the drawing. I'm essentially, I'm building it up with impasto. So uh, I've, I'm now I'm retouching with the white once again. And this process is very slow. Uh, I just found myself mixing a lot of color and just working into that glaze on the flesh, just superficially. I, I haven't done the full, the final touches yet. This is my second session. And there you see that I'm just pushing the lights, okay? And just building up more impasto. Now I'm moving to the third day, and this is the glazing and retouching. And this is uh, an important step there. I'm glazing the whole painting down with the, uh, the, the glaze mixture, and I'm using a rag to pull out the lights. Now I'm going to, this is an important step because this saturates the colors further and the shadows become darker. And now once I have this glaze sort of established, I will bring that glaze also in a little bit. You'll see how I bring that glaze in the background. But I once I have that, then I go back to the lights and I reestablish the impasto and the light. So it's, it's, I'm sort of repeating the steps um, and just to saturate the color 
you know, bring the light lighter and the darts darker. Um, and at this point, I'm really painting in a very loose, just sort of, you know, heavy, heavy, heavy impasto, um, putting touches there. I'm, I'm putting the glaze on the background, okay, to, to, to push that background black, back. It's important to remember, too, that this paint, this is, this painting has aged and the colors have uh, perhaps, you know, turned a little darker. Um, so I have to kind of counter that, and that's why I'm using a glaze to sort of imitate that. There you see that I'm applying the white band of the uh, the hat, and just really just being very methodical about the touches, and the touches are just applied directly on the canvas. I'm not doing any uh, modeling or fuzzing. I just put the paint down, and I try not to touch it or disturb it, because if not, you lose the impasto quality. So it seems like Rembrandt was just applying this paint very directly, almost drawing with touches uh, on, on, on the canvas. There's hardly any uh, what we call, you know, uh, blending or modeling. Just seems like he just applied the touches with the tip of the brush, um, the right color in the right place. And there I'm going to back in the hair. The hair is just nothing but impasto touches. Um, and that gives you the illusion of form and space. It's a beautiful technique. Um, I was very surprised at how, uh, how loose this painting is and how loose I ended up painting the, 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 whole, the whole copy. Um, and I did use the mall stick, which allowed me to do very precise loose touches, which is important. Uh, the mall stick is by no means a tool to paint in a very tight style. You could indeed use it to, uh, to you know, to essentially uh, create some beautiful touches. There, I've, I'm going back to the hat and finishing with glazes, and just to get that beautiful uh, saturation of color. Although the lake colors are fugitive, and probably in Rembrandt's final painting, I mean, in the in the original. The, the lake colors have faded. There I'm, I'm finishing with a palette knife and just scraping the paint on the, on the surface, okay? Um, I found that that no, especially around the color, the texture of the paint was indeed, uh, it had that, that quality that it was applied almost with a palette knife. And there's the final, uh, it was just three days of work. Um, and of course, you know, Rembrandt's brushwork is uh, masterful. I tried to achieve the, a similar quality, uh, but as you can see, the whole process of painting. Um, now, uh, it, it's important. One of the things that I, I discovered as I was working uh, on this uh, master copy is how loose and how direct the painting uh, was handled. Um, now. Today we tend to think, you know, uh, we transfer a drawing. A lot of artists transfer the drawing, or they use a uh, photography, uh, and they apply the paint and they they model the paint with a fan brush or you know, a softener brush. And that's not the way that I found myself painting, working on this uh, self portrait. It just it seemed closer to the way that an impressionist painter uh, out in the landscape would have been working. Uh, or even an abstract painter where it's just putting big blocks of color uh, and then reducing those uh, small blocks. So um, I have a question here. Uh, let's see. Uh, and let's see, I have a question. Um, and you have to excuse me. Uh, let's see. Maybe you could send me a question. All right, let's see. So Paul, um, uh, let's see. Uh, okay, hiding with with whites and is uh, lake color specific color or a, or a group of pigments. Thank you. So yeah, Paul. So thank you for coming by and thank you for your question. Um, so um, the the technique really implies you're using a very dark ground. And the dark ground is difficult. Uh, it's not like using a, a lighter ground where you could use semi-transparency. So in this technique, I found myself having to cover the ground uh, to achieve the halftone. Um, 
and that is difficult to do because uh, in, if you're using a, a you know a lighter ground, for example, a white ground with a, a, a thin imprimatura, then you will you could use you could take advantage of that uh, middle ground. But in this case, the ground was just too dark and uh, much too dark for the half tone. So I I had to really build uh, the light uh, the impasto quality to be able to turn the forms. Um, and then the lake colors are essentially, uh, th they include Matter Lake, Cochinia Lake. Today, those colors are equivalent to Alyssa and Crimson. Um, they're colors that are essentially are dyes, and they're, uh, they're manufactured by fixing a pigment to, or that dye to a base, such as an alum, alumina uh, base or alum. That's why it was used traditionally. It's, uh, it results in a very transparent color. The lake colors don't really have body or opacity. So, for example, if you have a white and you put a lake color, you'll get a pink color, right? Because the white is reflecting through that very, very transparent uh, red color, resulting in an uh, optical color mixture that it will turn the, the red color essentially a pink. So that's what I refer with lake colors. There's red lakes and there's also uh, yellow lakes. In this pigment, I mean, excuse me, in this paint painting, I did use uh, uh, steel de grain. Steel de grain is a pigment that was manufactured by boiling uh, buckthorn berries uh, fixed to uh, a chalk base. I have a, a description of that pigment in the, my last live presentation, and maybe you could check that out and uh, find out a little bit more about that particular pigment that was used. It's a fugitive color. Um, I don't use it in my paintings. I rather use the Indian, the modern Indian yellow, uh, but it was used by Rembrandt, and Vermeer, and a lot of other uh, 17th century Dutch artists. So, all right, well, um, so do we have any other questions? I don't think so, let's see. So, yeah, so that this is just a theoretical, and I wanna remind everyone, it's just a theoretical uh, uh, imaginary sequence of work. Um, I used uh, technical analysis, scientific data, and also my own uh, research to put this together. Now, whether Rembrandt used an underpainting, uh, monochromatic, uh, excuse me, a grisaille uh, layer in this particular portrait, well, um, we'll, we'll never know. I mean, we, we could go by the, the scientific analysis, and the scientific analysis only find a brownish color in the first layer, which is it's probably a thinned out brownish color to lay in the you know the the whole composition. So, but Rembrandt did use a grisaille or a monochromatic, uh, opaque grayish underlayer in some of his other paintings. So, and that's one thing that I always tell my students. Um, I don't like to put painters in in a category. Um, I like to uh, look at you know, their evolution throughout their lives. Uh, even Velasquez, a painter like Velasquez that uh, everyone considers is a very loose painter, you find a lot of pentimento and a lot of uh, different techniques all throughout his life. He's using, using a red ground in his early years and his later year and his early years and in his later years he's using uh, almost a white white ground like an impressionist painter. So it's important to do the research, and that's what I like to do uh, here on the channel. Uh, try to, you know, approach painting from a, almost a scientific point of view um, to sort of reconstruct these techniques that have been lost now. And a lot of these techniques were being invented by the, the artists working with them, you know. So um, uh, it's important to take that into account when you're learning to paint and, you know, when you're trying to reconstruct a technique or learn a technique for yourself, look at the whole scope of the work. How, you know, how, how does the work look? Yes, that's the first thing. Uh, does it feel that, it's, that it has an underlayer in gray? Or is it very colorful? Does it have a lot of texture? Or is it very thin paint? So these things just make a fundamental difference. And, um, you know, that's, that's essentially what I like to do in the channel, just do the analysis and try to be a subjective. Now, there is a lot of artists copying Rembrandt paintings with modern materials and using their own interpretation of the, uh, you know, the, of, of their techniques, you know. So um, you have to take into account that, you know, these are, every artist is gonna interpret the use of those techniques in different ways. So, um, all right, so, and for those of you that are still, you know, sort of 
figuring out how to um, uh, you know, work with uh, glazing and working with painting. I'm putting together um, a, a whole course dedicated. I'm putting this full demonstration on Udemy. It's going to be available probably in about two weeks' time, and it'll be a full class uh, with, you know, uh, the, uh, the, the seven hours. It's, it's a total of eight or ten hours of demonstration for this particular painting. I'm going to be detailing the palette, the mixtures in detail, and also what is the underpainting, the, uh, the working up, and the glazing and retouching. So um, that's essentially, uh, uh, and I think we have another another question here. Um, so anyways, uh, I'll be sharing the link with you guys for those of you that are just uh, learning to paint. Let's see here. Um, let's see. Uh, Uther, uh, thank you for coming by. Let's see. In the painting, Jacob the Trip, Jacob the Trip, do you think the greenish gray around the eyes and hair are the brown too? Um, well, it's, I, so the most important thing is having access to great images of these paintings. Now, the photography really distorts a lot. And one of the things that I like to do is I like to go to the museum. That's part of what I do. I, I go, I travel to a lot of these collections and I take my own photographs because sometimes you get very different. Uh, now I have never seen this painting that you're talking about, but if, you know, I, I, I have made uh, so many mistakes in the past, even in my own uh, research where I, you know, I have decided that perhaps a painting used a grisson and I, I go to the museum and I'll see the painting. And indeed it looks like it was just a, you know, a very direct painting. So it's important to get good photographs. And if you have access to, um, to seeing the actual painting in the museum, that's really the best, the best option because you could, the, the paint doesn't really photograph well. Um, there's a lot of distortion that occurs in the texture and the color. So my recommendation is um, to see these paintings in person. Um, one little trick that I always, uh, well, I'll recommend it. It's to take a, a magnifying glass. And when you're looking at a, a painting, you could, in the corner, the corner of the painting, always look at the corners because you could see sometimes the ground exposed. You could see what type of ground the painting or the, the artist used for the ground um, and, and what type of color. Um, also, uh, if you're, if you stand at a certain angle, sometimes you can see that an area is glazed because the light is hitting it in a different way. And even looking at the raking light, you can see if there's a lot of buildup of paint or no buildup of paint. So these these uh, uh, images or evidence of you know how the working process of the artist is really important. So I couldn't really tell you in particular. You know, it's important to uh, maybe if you could share some images, uh, detailed images. Um, I would, I, you know, I would have a better idea of, you know, how how to answer your question. But, but it's, you know, it's interesting to to sort of theorize how, you know, whether in this in this particular painting uh, that I copied, they do find the ground around the eyes. And if you guys notice, I just took the analysis, the chemical analysis, and I sort of followed, you know, to the, my best of my ability to uh, use the very strategies that Rembrandt. Use. For example, around the eyes, it does seem like he leaves the ground exposed. That's exactly what I did. I used, but I did veil slightly. I found myself having to veil with just a slight color over the ground, just to, to you know to match the tone. So whether he did that or not, I'm not really sure. But again, we're we're trying to uh, learn from this master, and we're trying to learn his approach. So uh, you know, you could. The best way to do it is just to sort of create, you know, theoretical questions. That's what I do here for the live presentations. I have theoretic, theoretical questions about the technique, and I share those with you guys by answering, you know, creating a live presentation that answers some of those questions. So, um, all right. Well, uh, thank you for coming by. Your questions are always welcome. It's wonderful to, to see you here and, you know, to, to share uh, the content with you guys. Um, I want to tell you about my Udemy courses before I go. Um, 
Now, this course is, I've worked very hard in establishing a curriculum for a lot of you that are coming by and they're probably uh, wondering, you know, um, uh, how do you do an underpainting? What is an underpainting? What is an underdrawing? What is a proportional drawing? Or how do you use calibers? Um, these courses are designed to sort of answer those questions. Uh, they're available at the Udemy server. I've uh, included uh, in the description below some links for you guys. Uh, the courses are uh, established as uh, a basic course with classical drawing. Then it progresses to the portrait drawing course. And then there's uh, classical uh, materials and techniques uh, drawing course. And I'm going to be soon releasing uh, the Rembrandt uh, technique course, which will be available at the Udemy server. And you could support the channel by purchasing these courses. Also, remember that I do uh, earn a commission from the links for the books. So if you want to use those to get some other books, that'll be wonderful to help out the channel. And I just want to thank everyone uh, for your wonderful support, uh, your questions. Uh, a lot of you follow me on Instagram. If you're not aware of my Instagram account, it's uh, Luis Guerrero Art on Instagram. So you could, you know, check that out. Uh, for those of you that speak Spanish, I have a lot of uh, Spanish viewers. Um, you could log on to my live presentations on Atelier San Juan uh, Facebook. So there's a lot of resources, and um, I'm going to continue. Uh, I, I've had some requests. Uh, from some of you to do uh, live presentations on Tiepolo, Vermeer. So I will be uh, coming back with another live presentation with more questions and hopefully more answers. So I, uh, I'm really thankful. We've officially today uh, reached 800 viewers. So the channel's growing. I'm really happy about that. Um, I started with you know, a limited amount of viewers, and uh, these are very, very... Uh, scientific analysis uh, about the art of painting and not everyone's interested so i really appreciate your support and i'm going to be back in two weeks time with another live presentation thank you again for coming by have a good day and stay safe